Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are continuing through our series where we talk about the Book of Enoch. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Book of Enoch, this is a book that is not in your traditional Bibles. It is an ancient Jewish book that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was very influential on the early church and it was quoted by the Apostle Jude. And we've talked about all of that already in the first video in the series. And I really suggest you go back there and you get kind of more of the the background and hear this argument I'm presenting from beginning to end. So in this video, I'm continuing where I left off in the last video of going through references in the New Testament to the book of Enoch, showing many different times where the apostles and Jesus were quoting or referencing the book of Enoch, or in some cases where Enoch is describing things in heaven that no man has seen, and he's describing the same thing that John says in Revelation when he sees things in heaven that no man has seen. And Enoch was definitively, historically and archaeologically, it was definitely written before Jesus and before the apostles. We have it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have manuscripts that those, those manuscripts were written down hundreds of years before Jesus. So if Enoch is describing things in heaven that no man has seen. And he describes it the exact same way that John describes it in the book of Revelation when John sees things in heaven that no man has seen. Well, the only possible explanation, if we accept that Revelation is scripture, which I absolutely do, the only possible explanation is that whoever wrote the book of Enoch truly did see things in heaven that no man has seen truly did have visions from God, truly did write down words from God, in which case we should be reading it, right? And so those are sort of the things that we're going through in this series. We're talking about the book of Enoch and we're drawing the parallels from the book of Enoch to the New Testament. Now, again, if you don't know where any of this is coming from, if you're jumping into the series in this video, you got to start at the beginning. You, you can't jump in right here. So stop and go back and start at the beginning because you're in the middle of my argument and I've already presented a lot of information that I'm not gonna present again. Okay, so picking up where we left off in the last video, we are going to look at 1st Enoch chapter 89. Now in chapter 89 of 1st Enoch, he's describing this vision he had, which is a parable and he calls it a parable. In this vision, in this parable, Enoch saw all of human history from Adam all the way to the end. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, because I'm not going to read the whole thing. You got to read it for yourself. But just to give you a little bit of context, the vision is depicting human history using animals as representations of different people and people groups. So that's really important to understand because we're going to look at how that parallel, that depiction is referenced heavily in the New Testament. They were clearly reading this parable and they kept pointing back to it. So just to give you a, a picture of it, I'm just gonna jump in at verse 10. This is shortly after the flood. And again, all of the people of humanity are depicted as animals. And they began to bring out beasts of the field and birds so that there arose different genera lions, tigers, wolves, dogs, hyenas, wild boars, foxes, squirrels, swine, falcons, vultures, kites, eagles, and ravens. And among them was born a white bull. Okay, so just pausing there real quick. This is saying, essentially, there's all these different people groups. And as you read through the parable, you begin to understand that each of those animals represents a different people group. And the white bull is Abraham. 
And that becomes very clear as we keep reading. It says, And they began to bite one another. But that white bull, which was born among them, begat a wild ass and a white bull with it. And the wild asses multiplied. But that bull, which was born from him, begat a black wild boar and a white sheep. And the former begat many boars, but that sheep begat twelve sheep. And when those twelve sheep had grown, they gave up one of them to the asses, and those asses again gave up that sheep to the wolves. So just pausing here to help you understand the picture. Abraham is the white bull. He has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael is described as a wild ass, and Isaac is described as a white bull. Isaac then has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau is described as a black wild boar, and Jacob is described as a white sheep. Then Jacob has 12 sons, and those 12 sons are described as 12 sheep. We know the story of Joseph. The 11 brothers betrayed Joseph and sold him into slavery, and they actually sold him to the Ishmaelites, who again, if you look at this parable, Ishmael was a wild ass, and this says they sold him to the asses. And the asses then gave him to the wolves. So the wolves, if we know the story, the wolves are Egypt. Now, I'm pausing right here because this is really interesting when you understand some of the things in the New Testament that, quite frankly, a lot of Christians don't understand. And I'm not going to dive 100% into this, but just essentially... The New Testament draws a ton of parallels to the Exodus story. You've got Jesus who went down to Egypt. He came out of Egypt. He passed through the water when he was baptized, and then he went into the wilderness where he spent 40 days being tempted. That is the exact story of the Exodus. And then after the 40 days, he enters the promised land and he begins saying, the kingdom of God is here. There are so many parallels there that are really important to pay attention to. And furthermore, if you begin to look at those parallels, you begin to see this theme that essentially Jesus is the new Moses. He is the new one sent by God, the new anointed one who's coming, sent by God to deliver his people out of slavery. And the New Testament teaches that we are set free from sin. We are no longer slaves of sin. This is one of the important reasons why we need to recognize Jesus did not die on the day of atonement. He died on Passover because it's about coming out of slavery. There are so many parallels to the story of the people coming out of Egypt, the, the story of them being set free from slavery in Egypt. Jesus parallels that in so many ways, and that's really important for us to understand. And for the purpose of this video, that's important for us to understand because Jesus keeps referencing that over and over throughout the things he said. This is what the book of Enoch says. Again, this is talking about Joseph. He is sold into Egypt. Okay? That sheep grew up among the wolves. And the Lord brought the eleven sheep to live with it and to pasture with it among the wolves. And they multiplied and became many flocks of sheep. And the wolves began to fear them, and they oppressed them until they destroyed their little ones, and they cast their young into a river of much water. But those sheep began to cry aloud on account of their little ones and to complain unto their Lord. So right away, you can probably recognize the parallel there. In this parable, in this vision that Enoch had, the people of Israel are represented as sheep, specifically Joseph and his brothers. But again, those were the children of Israel at that time. And in future generations, the people of Israel were all the children of Israel. Okay, so this is, this is the people of Israel at this time are represented as sheep. Those 12 had kids. They were all called sheep. They're living in Egypt. And it says that Egypt is wolves and the sheep are living among the wolves. Okay, that's the picture Enoch puts forward. Well, again, that was written before Jesus. Jesus then comes along and he's paralleling the Exodus story in so many ways. But one of the important things is he's saying, he's the Passover lamb, we're coming out of slavery, but we're not entering the promised land just yet. We're not, we're not quite there yet. 
And Jesus tells us, listen, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. So be as cunning as snakes and as innocent as doves. This is just one example of where Jesus said this, but repeatedly Jesus said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. You are sheep among wolves, sheep among wolves. And quite frankly, throughout what Jesus was teaching, he kept referring to the people of Israel as sheep. All of this, in, to his original audience, all of these references would have pointed back to the book of Enoch, where the Israelites are depicted as sheep, and when they were in Egypt, being oppressed, surrounded by their enemies, they were sheep among wolves. That's Enoch's phrase. So Enoch wrote, they were sheep among wolves first, and then Jesus comes along saying, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And if we begin to recognize all the parallels between the Exodus story and Jesus, it starts to make a lot of sense. So that's one connection that you can see in this, in this parable, in this vision that Enoch had. But I'm going to draw attention to another one. As you follow the story along and you skip forward a little bit, after the people came out of Egypt, as they were wandering through the wilderness, they were led by Moses and Aaron. But eventually Moses and Aaron died. Joshua and Caleb became the leaders and the people followed Joshua and Caleb into the promised land. Now, before they went into the promised land, God told them, you need to drive out the Canaanites. Okay, the Canaanites currently live in this land. I'm driving them out. You need to drive them out. And if you don't drive them out, he says, they will be a thorn in your side. They will constantly attack you. They will lead you away from me. And they're going to cause you a ton of pain. So you need to get them out. But if you don't get them out, that's what's going to happen. And if we read through the book of Judges, we can see exactly what ended up happening. They failed to drive them all out. They drove out some of them, but they failed to drive them all out. And sure enough, the Canaanites became a thorn in their side. They kept attacking them and they kept leading them away to other gods. That's the story of the book of Judges. In the book of Enoch, he is talking about that story as well in this parable. He talks about the sheep entering into a goodly land. He talks about how sometimes their eyes were opened and sometimes they were blinded until another sheep would arise and lead them back to God. That is the book of Judges. If you look at it, it's like they fall away and then God raises up a leader. They follow that leader and they're all following God until that leader dies and then they go away again. And then another leader rises up and they follow that leader. They follow God until that leader dies and then they go away again. It's just this constant back and forth. And the book of Enoch says, sometimes they're following God and their eyes are open and sometimes they're blinded and they're not until another leader rises up. But then Enoch says, and the dogs and the foxes and the wild boars began to devour those sheep until the Lord of the sheep raised up a ram from their midst, which led them. And if you keep reading, you can see that this ram is King Saul, the first king of Israel. And that ram began to butt on either side, those dogs, foxes, and wild boars, until he had destroyed them all. And that sheep whose eyes were opened saw that ram, which was among the sheep, until it forsook its glory and began to butt those sheep and trampled upon them and behaved itself unseemly. The sheep whose eyes are opened in this verse is Samuel, the prophet. And the ram, Saul, falls away and begins attacking his own people and is not a good king. And the Lord of the sheep sent the lamb, Samuel, to another lamb and raised it to be a ram and leader of the sheep instead of that other ram, which had forsaken its glory. So God sends Samuel to David to raise him up as the new king. And it went to it and spoke to it alone and raised it to be a ram and made it the prince and leader of the sheep. But during all these things, those dogs oppressed the sheep. And the first ram pursued that second ram and that second ram arose and fled before it. And I saw until those dogs pulled down the first ram. This is the story of David and Saul. Samuel goes and anoints David to be king, but he's not king quite yet. Saul is still king. Saul then chases David away. And all this time, the Canaanites keep attacking the people of Israel. And it says right there, those dogs oppress the sheep. Eventually, Saul is killed by those Canaanites. 
And it says, I saw until those dogs pulled down the first ram. And then he says, and that second ram arose and led the little sheep and those sheep grew and multiplied, but all the dogs and foxes and wild boars feared and fled before it. And that ram butted and killed the wild beasts and those wild beasts had no longer any power among the sheep and robbed them no more. So that is the story of David when he became king. That is when the Canaanites finally stopped being this oppressive power in the land. Doesn't mean they no longer played any role. You see them come back a little bit later on in the book of Esther. But the point being, when David became king, that no longer happened. Now, my point for this video is this. The Canaanites in Enoch's parable are represented by dogs. Okay, remember, all of the different people groups of the world are represented by different animals. That was all the way back in Enoch 89 verse 10. All these different animals represent all these different people groups. The Canaanites are represented by dogs. That is the that is what the book of Enoch says in this parable. The Canaanites are represented by dogs. So, let's go look at the book of Matthew. In Matthew 15, it says, Jesus left that place and went to the area of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that area came to Jesus and cried out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But Jesus did not answer her a word. So his disciples came to Jesus and begged him, Tell the woman to go away. She's following us and shouting. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep, the house of Israel. I'm going to pause there real quick. He is, by saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep, he's already drawing, drawing their attention back to this vision that Enoch had. Because this is the first place where the people of Israel were ever called sheep. In fact, you don't really see that that comparison very much in the Old Testament. And yet you see it all throughout the New Testament. The book of Enoch refers to the people of Israel as sheep. So Jesus is immediately drawing that connection there. But let's continue. Then the woman came to Jesus again and bowed before him and said, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. The woman said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. I will do what you asked. And at that moment, the woman's daughter was healed. Okay, so, this woman comes to Jesus. She is a Canaanite woman. She comes to Jesus. Jesus immediately draws the disciples' attention to Enoch's parable. That's his first thing. I was sent to the sheep, the sheep of Israel. Here comes a Canaanite woman. She comes up to Jesus. She says, help me. And he says, it's not right to take the children's food and throw it to dogs. Now, I don't know about you, but I always read this story and was like, Jesus, it really comes across to me and quite frankly, to most Christians I know, it really comes across as like, Jesus kind of just insulted her. Like, what? why does he just call her a dog all of a sudden? That seems so weird. But what's even weirder is the fact that the woman wasn't offended by it. She was like, well, yeah, but even the dogs eat the food that falls from the table. It's like our culture, our mindset today, especially without the book of Enoch in the background, our, our mindset is like, what is going on in this in this story? Why is Jesus just randomly calling this woman a dog, which is so insulting? But furthermore, why is she not offended by that? Why does she not back off and be like, sheesh, man, like, calm down. Like, what is going on in this story? Well, if you understand that the book of Enoch was something they were all familiar with, and this parable in Enoch was something they were all familiar with, well, you'd understand that they were all familiar with the fact that the people of Israel were represented by sheep and the Canaanites were represented as dogs in this vision. It's just a representation. Jesus is saying it's not right 
for me to take what is for God's people and to give it to the Canaanites. But the woman says, yes, but even the Canaanites will get what spills over. This story with the Canaanite woman and Jesus makes a whole lot more sense and does not seem nearly as insulting to her if you understand that they were drawing from the book of Enoch. They were referencing a book that we don't read in our Bibles so we don't understand what they are saying. It was not an insult. It was just a reference back to this story. Jesus is referencing, look, there are God's people who are sheep and there are other people of other nations and your people are represented as dogs in this ancient vision that we're all familiar with. That's all it was. And if we understand that, that story makes a lot more sense. So that's an example of how we can see the book of Enoch being referenced in the New Testament. And we don't see that if we're not familiar with the book of Enoch. It just seems like random words. It seems like this weird story where Jesus calls a woman a dog and then she doesn't even care. But if we understand that they're talking about a book that we still have available to us to read today, a book that they were all familiar with, a book that they all read and Jesus referenced a number of times and called scripture, then we'd understand that that wasn't an insult. It was just drawing a connection back. It was just pointing back at this other book. Let's keep looking at some more examples. If we keep looking at this parable in Enoch, in Enoch chapter 89, there's one more thing we can take from it. And that is, as a, if I go back to verse 10, where it talks about all the different people groups and it assigns each people group an, an animal representation. Well, let's look at that list. It says, and they began to bring out beasts of the field and birds so that there arose different genera, lions, tigers, wolves, dogs, hyenas, wild boars, foxes, squirrels, swine, falcons, vultures, kites, eagles, and ravens, and among them was born a white bull. So those are, those are all the animals that are listed there, but then it proceeds to say that white bull had uh, two sons, a wild ass, and a white bull with it. That white bull had two sons, a wild boar, and a white sheep, and that sheep had 12 sheep. So you've got all of God's people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's sons, described as bulls and sheep. And then you've got all of the other nations, all the other people groups, the Gentile people, described as lions, tigers, wolves, dogs, hyenas, wild boars, foxes, squirrels, swine, falcons, vultures, kites, eagles, and ravens, and wild asses. Here's the significance of this. All of God's people are clean animals, and all of the Gentiles are unclean animals. This should help us understand what the law is trying to teach us with all the food laws, all the food rules about clean animals and unclean animals. Okay, scripture tells us that the law was meant to teach us something. So we need to understand what the law is teaching. But furthermore, for, further than that, I wanna to point to the New Testament because in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Peter has a vision. In Acts 10, it says, The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, 
Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Now, if we continue this story, we'll see that Peter ended up going to the house of all these Gentiles. And the Jewish people wouldn't do that because the Gentiles were considered to be unclean, just like those unclean animals in Peter's vision. But Peter says to those Gentiles, you people understand that it's against our law for Jewish people to associate with or visit anyone who is a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. That's why I didn't argue when I was asked to come here. So in other words, when we look at this story, we see that Peter has this vision of all these unclean animals and God says, do not call unclean what I've made clean. All of those animals are unclean animals. And yet God is using it to show him that he's making the Gentiles clean. He's making a way for the Gentiles. He's saying they are now clean. But you notice the story. Peter says, God showed me that I shouldn't call any person common or unclean. That's why I didn't argue when you asked me to come here. Okay, that all happened right after Peter had this vision. In the time it took for him to have this vision and then go downstairs and open the door and answer the door for these people, he had figured it out because the unclean animals to him represented the Gentiles. He understood why the unclean animals were called unclean because those animals represent the Gentiles and God's people were told over and over in the law, don't associate with them. Don't join yourselves to them because they're going to lead you astray. And the unclean animals represented the Gentiles, and he knew that because that's what Enoch said. The book of Enoch says all of these Gentile nations are these animals. And then God said, these animals are unclean for you. And so Peter was able to very quickly make that connection and see, oh, God's saying, don't call unclean what I've made clean. And all of a sudden these Gentiles show up and say, come to us and speak to us. I get it. He's saying the Gentiles are clean. He's saying, don't call the Gentiles unclean if I've made them clean. So I'm going to go. In both visions, Enoch and Peter's vision, the Gentiles are represented by unclean animals. That's the point. That's my point for this video. If you want to understand why some animals are clean and some animals are unclean, you got to understand the book of Enoch. They're all interconnected. The book of Enoch, the law of Moses, the New Testament, these things are all interconnected. And so we got to understand the full picture. We can't just look at parts and not the whole thing. The book of Enoch said all of these Gentile nations are these animals. God then came along later and said, you should not be joining yourselves to these nations because they're going to lead you away from me. So here's a picture to constantly remind you of this. All of these animals, they're unclean. Don't touch them. Don't go near them. And then later on, God came to Peter and he said, you see these animals? Don't call unclean what I have now made clean and he sent his apostles to the Gentiles and opened a way for them. The book of Enoch is an integral part of this story. If you want to understand the rest of this that's been going on in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, you got to understand where it started. You got to understand why they saw those animals as unclean in the first place, what that was painting for the people of Israel throughout the Old Covenant. They were constantly being reminded the Gentiles are not clean. Do not do what they do. Do not join them. Do not intermarry with them. Stay separate. That is something reiterated all throughout the Law and the Prophets. And it's something that their list of clean animals versus unclean animals would have been reinforcing to them the entire time. That's what it was all about. 
Okay, now let's move on from this parable, this vision of Enoch, and just keep looking at other parallels from the book of Enoch to the New Testament and see ways that the book of Enoch was clearly influencing or at least very similar to what is said in the New Testament. In Enoch 94, starting in verse 8, it says, Woe to you, you rich, for you have trusted in your riches, and from your riches you will depart, because you have not remembered the Most High in the days of your riches. You have committed blasphemy and unrighteousness, and have become ready for the day of slaughter and the day of darkness and the day of the great judgment. Similarly, James wrote, You rich people, come now, weep and be very sad because of the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and silver have corroded, and that corrosion will be a proof that you were wrong. It will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up your riches in the last days. The wages you did not give the workers who mowed your fields cries out against you, and the cries of the workers have been heard by the Lord All-Powerful. Your life on earth was full of luxury and pleasing yourselves with everything you wanted. You made yourselves fat, for a day of slaughter. So both these passages are saying, woe to you rich. You trusted in your riches and you made yourself fat for a day of slaughter. Could it be that James is referencing the book of Enoch? I think it's possible. In Enoch chapter 100, Enoch is talking about the day of judgment that is coming at the end of the world. And he says in verse three, the horse will walk up to the breast in the blood of sinners and the chariot will be submerged to its depth. Similarly, in Revelation 14, John describes the day of judgment saying, they were trampled in the wine press outside the city and the blood flowed out of the wine press as high as horses bridles for a distance of about 180 miles. So there we have another example of Enoch seeing the day of judgment, John seeing the day of judgment, and they both describe the same thing using the same analogy. So I'm just gonna wrap this up here. This has not been an exhaustive list. This has just been some examples across the book of Enoch and across the New Testament where we can see these parallels. We can see these things where either the apostles and Jesus were referencing the book of Enoch, quoting the book of Enoch, influenced by the book of Enoch, or places like this last one where Enoch and John are looking prophetically through a vision or whatever, and they're seeing the same thing. And if Enoch is describing the same thing that John saw, then what Enoch said must be true because it was written first. Okay, the book of Enoch is not something that is drawing from what John said. No, the book of Enoch was written first. And if it says the same thing John said, and if what John said is truly scripture and is a true vision from God, then the book of Enoch must be as well. So we can see through this video and the last video that the book of Enoch was very influential on the New Testament. And as I said in the last video, this is something that scholars widely recognize. This is not debated among scholars. It's just something that the average Christian doesn't know. Okay, Peter knows this literature. And because he's read it, he has a fuller picture of what Genesis 6, 1 through 4 means, how it operates, why it's there, why the first four verses make sense of the fifth verse, that the human wickedness, it juxtaposed to the sons of God event. Peter understands that and he uses it in his discussion to avoid false teachers. It makes perfect sense across the board for him to do this. The book of life, these heavenly books, there's a lot of stuff like that in Enoch. Lake of fire, final judgment, just the general you know, apocalyptic stuff you know, that you read in the book of Revelation. Guess what? Enoch was there first, you know? You know, Peter quotes from Enoch, Jude quotes from Enoch. There's stuff in the Gospels that, again, are directly traceable to, to things in Enoch. It, you know, it has its, its fingerprints on the New Testament in a lot of places, even if it's not a direct quotation. So it's, it's useful to know what in the world the book's about. 
The average Christian does not know that all of these Christian scholars acknowledge that Jesus and the apostles were influenced by the book of Enoch. And yet most Christians haven't even heard of the book of Enoch. That's got to change. If Jesus and the apostles were influenced by the book of Enoch and teaching from the book of Enoch and quoting the book of Enoch, then we need to stop dismissing the book of Enoch as if we know better than Jesus and the apostles. If they approved of this book, then we should approve of this book too. So I'm going to wrap up this section of this series. In my next video, I'm going to start going through the book of Enoch and talking about all the parts that specifically talk about Jesus. Because this is really important it's where the apostles were getting a lot of their understanding of who the Messiah is. For example, Paul describes Jesus as the firstborn of all creation. Where did he get that from? Well, he got that from the book of Enoch. And we're going to look at all that stuff. And so that's what we're going to start looking at in our next video. So thank you for joining me. I hope you've found this all very interesting at the very least. And again, I don't want you to just take my arguments and say, oh, cool, I'm going to read it. I just want you guys to hear me out and look into it for yourself and decide for yourself. Should we blindly follow man's tradition that tells us the book of Enoch is not an important book? Or should we read it? Should we consider it scripture? Let's look at scripture to decide. We know these books are scripture. So let's look at scripture to decide what we think about Enoch and not man's traditions and the canon of scripture we've been given because the canon of scripture is a man's tradition men decided the bible never tells us what books should be in it and what book should not be in it so thanks for joining me in this video please join me in the next video where i talk about what enoch has to say about jesus himself because that one is fascinating and actually even though Jude quoted Enoch and called it prophecy and, and Jesus taught from the book of Enoch and called it scripture, the thing that really sealed it for me is something I'm going to talk about in the next video. Because I want to show you something in that video that the book of Enoch says about Jesus that could not have been said about Jesus before he was born unless the book of Enoch is truly scripture. We know this book predates Jesus, okay? Book of Enoch was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It predates Jesus. And it says something about him that could not have been written before him unless this is true scripture. So join me in the next video as we take a look at that and other things that Enoch had to say about our Lord. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video.